Welcome to the fair city of Dublin, the capital of Ireland. Home to more than half a million people, this modern-day metropolis is known all over the world for its lively atmosphere, vibrant nightlife and wealth of heritage. And on this epic 80-minute walk around the city, we'll explore the streets, sights and stories that make up this captivating capital city. We'll make our way past famous landmarks like the Haypenny Bridge, Christchurch Cathedral, the Molly Malone statue, the Temple Bar and the Irish government buildings. And we'll also venture into the grounds of the city's prestigious Trinity College, take a walk along the busy Grafton Street and stroll through the beautiful natural surroundings of St Stephen's Green. All of that and so much more is to come over the course of this walk and if you'd like to follow this route for yourself you can find a link to a map of this walk in the description and comments below. Our walk on this cloudy afternoon then begins at the very start of Dublin's more than 1,000 years of history in the Dublin Gardens that sit in the shadow of the mighty Dublin Castle. The city of Dublin takes its name from the Irish Dublin, which literally means Black Pool, and the Dublin Gardens here are laid out on the site of that original Black Pool, simply a large puddle of murky water where the small river Poddle flowed into the much larger River Liffey. The Poddle still flows through Dublin right beneath our feet now covered over by the Dublin Gardens, in which we find this striking building, known as the Coach House. Built in 1833, the Coach House was effectively built as a parking garage for the coach and horses of the Viceroy, or Lord Lieutenant, of Ireland, the head of British government here. And the building's castle-style facade was designed to fit in with the surroundings as nearby Dublin Castle served as the Viceroy's residence as well as the seat of the government of the British. We'll venture into Dublin Castle in a few minutes time, but there's plenty more to see around the Dublin Gardens here, including the Chester Beatty, a historic library and museum that's home to over 25,000 books, paintings, manuscripts and more from all over the world, originally collected by the mining tycoon Alfred Chester Beatty. Elsewhere in these historic gardens, you'll find fetching modern art sculptures and statues, a memorial garden dedicated to the Garda Siakana, Ireland's National Police Service, and, if you look across the central lawn, some lovely Celtic patterns that are mowed into the grass, representing sea serpents, which are a nod to the city's famous association with the Vikings. It was here in the Black Pool that Viking traders visiting Dublin would usually moor their boats which were often decorated with terrifying depictions of sea serpents. Officially, Vikings were here to trade with Dublin locals, but as was the case elsewhere in Europe, they had a bit more of an impression than that, with Viking settlement in Dublin recorded as long ago as the year 841 AD, nearly 1200 years ago. Dublin also suffered the odd Viking raid in that period, but over the following couple of centuries, the Vikings actually led Dublin to develop into the wealthiest and most important town in Ireland, a position that the city retains more than a millennium later. You'll find more examples of Viking heritage elsewhere in the city, but having now made our way out of the Dublin Gardens, let's turn our attention to the building towering above us here, Dublin Castle. Originally built over 800 years ago in the year 1204, Dublin Castle began life as a simple Mott and Bailey castle built by the Normans, who made their way across the sea from their conquered lands in Great Britain and established dominance on the Emerald Isle. Dublin Castle was initially built as a defensive structure, but it also served as a show of Norman power over the Irish, and so began the castle's centuries of life as the centre of power and government in Ireland under a number of different authorities. Now very little of that original Norman era castle remains today. Most was burned down in a number of great fires in the late 17th century. But the castle was rebuilt on an even grander scale. Medieval wooden buildings replaced by modern imposing features like the beautiful building we're walking past here. This is the Chapel Royal, one of the newest parts of Dublin Castle opened just over 200 years ago in 1814. The chapel was designed as a place of Protestant worship for the British Viceroy, who lived inside the castle, 
But in the 20th century, following independence from the United Kingdom, this formerly Anglican chapel was reconsecrated as a Catholic church, the majority religion in the Republic of Ireland. Neighboured by the historic Record Tower, one of the last remaining parts of the original 13th century castle, the Chapel Royal, no longer used for worship, is nowadays one of the many highlights of a visit to Dublin Castle, which you can venture inside and explore in depth on a guided tour. Because while Dublin Castle was for centuries a symbol of power and authority in Ireland, since independence, the nation's government has moved away to the Edwardian government buildings on Merrion Street, which we'll pass by near to the end of our walk. The castle, though still owned by the government, was briefly used as a courthouse, but now it occupies a more symbolic position in the city centre, mostly used to host state occasions like the inaugurations of Irish presidents, all of which have taken place at Dublin Castle since 1938. Most of the year, however, the castle is open for visitors to explore, and it's a real privilege to be able to easily wander into what was once one of the most important and tightly guarded landmarks in all of Ireland. We now find ourselves in what's known as the Upper Yard, the castle's beautiful main courtyard, which was laid out in the aftermath of the devastating fires that destroyed the medieval castle. Surrounding the courtyard today are a wealth of eye-catching Georgian-era buildings, the most famous of which is this, the Bedford Tower originally built in the 1750s on the site of the original Norman-era castle gate. Once upon a time then, this would have been the principal entrance to the imposing castle, though the building that stands today is home to a large hall, used mostly as a conference centre in the modern day. The whole of this sprawling castle complex is home to a number of great halls, and just across the upper yard from the Bedford Tower, there stand the State Apartments, originally built in the 1680s as the place of residence for the Viceroy, and which now play host to some of Ireland's most extravagant ceremonial rooms. When Ireland was ruled by the British, kings and queens would regularly visit Dublin Castle, and sit upon a throne inside the castle's ornate throne room, which is nowadays one of the many rooms that you can walk through on a tour of the castle. Elsewhere in the old state apartments is St Patrick's Hall, the modern venue for presidential inaugurations, the Grand State Drawing Room, and most interestingly, the James Connolly Room, once part of the Viceroy's living quarters, but since renamed in honour of a prominent Irish Republican. A leading revolutionary in the uprising against British rule in the early 20th century, it was inside the James Connolly Room that he was treated for injuries sustained during the Easter Rising of 1916. Shortly afterwards, British authorities sent Connolly to death by execution at Dublin's Kilmainham Jail. But it was during this famous period of conflict that Dublin Castle here was for the last time involved in battle. As we make our way out of the Upper Yard, it was on the 24th of April 1916, at the very beginning of the Easter Rising, that a small troop of around 25 revolutionaries, led by James Connolly, launched an assault on Dublin Castle taking control of a guard room near to where we are now. In the process, they killed a policeman named James O'Brien, who had tried to stop them, and O'Brien is often considered to have been the very first casualty of the Easter Rising. But despite a promising start in their assault of the lightly guarded castle, the rebels failed to fully seize the fortress, and by the next morning, a larger British force arrived and captured them, most later being executed for their role in the uprising. However, over the following five days, the city of Dublin was overwhelmed by conflict, as the epicentre of an uprising which marked the beginning of Ireland's revolutionary period against the British. Despite its immense impact and legacy, the rising was only short, lasting less than a week as tens of thousands of British troops poured into Dublin, and ruthlessly forced the rebels into an unconditional surrender. Even after the surrender, the British authorities kept Ireland under a state of martial law, and it was this heavy-handed approach to the Rising, and its aftermath, that began turning public opinion against the government. And just two years later in 1918, the Republican Sinn Féin party took a landslide victory in the Irish general election, and declared independence from the United Kingdom. This was followed by an all-out war of independence that lasted until 1921, though the Irish emerged victorious, 
and Dublin, as the capital of the new Irish Free State, played a major role in the transition to the independent Ireland that we know today. We'll talk more about Dublin and the revolutionary period later on in our walk. But we've now made our way away from the castle grounds and emerged onto the busy streets of the Irish capital. This being Christchurch Place, named for the grand church that's hiding behind the trees just in front of us here. Situated on what was the main road through medieval Dublin, before this street was Christchurch Place, it was known as Skinner's Row, home to rows of workshops in which the city's leather makers plied their trade. Nowadays, this is a less industrial part of the city, and it's instead dominated by a number of large religious buildings, the biggest being this, Christchurch Cathedral. In the Middle Ages, the centre of the city of Dublin was situated a little further to the west than it is today, marked by this iconic church that stood at the heart of the burgeoning settlement. Founded nearly 1,000 years ago in the year 1030, during Dublin's Viking Age, Christchurch Cathedral has grown and grown and grown in line with the city around it. Most of the building as we see it today dates from the 19th century, when a major renovation took place after the church had fallen into neglect over the preceding centuries. However, the current building in parts features stonework that dates all the way back to the 12th century, when the Normans rebuilt the original Viking Cathedral. As such, Christchurch Cathedral is often touted as the oldest building in Dublin that's still in use today. But it's neighboured by yet more beautiful and historic landmarks, like the Synod House just across the road, built in 1871, and which is uniquely linked to the cathedral by a Victorian-era covered footbridge that spans Wine Tavern Street. Like the cathedral, the Synod House is a work of the Victorian era, one of the many deceptively modern landmarks that stand tall on the streets of medieval Dublin, the oldest part of Ireland's capital. Christchurch Cathedral, as the main church in the city, held a particularly lofty status in medieval Ireland. Here in the cathedral grounds, we can see the ruins of the medieval chapter house, the meeting place for leading clerics in the city. But inside the cathedral itself, you'll find some of Ireland's most valuable relics and treasures of all ranging from manuscripts dating all the way back to the church's original founding, an exceptional silver plate that was awarded to the city of Dublin by William of Orange in 1697, as thanks for his victory at the significant Battle of the Boyne, and there's even an extremely rare copy of the Magna Carta Hiberniae, Ireland's own Magna Carta that was issued in 1216 under King John, one year after the English version was sealed at Runnymede. For centuries, the cathedral has also been a place of pilgrimage for people from all over the world, while nowadays, as you'll have noticed from the crowds around, it's a popular tourist destination for visitors to Dublin, as one of the city's oldest and most impressive landmarks of all. But having taken a look around the cathedral grounds, we're now going to make our way eastwards into the very heart of the modern city of Dublin, the place where much of the action in the city is today. Though, if you do visit Dublin for yourself, it's worth taking the time to explore the old medieval town just behind us, home to more historic churches, the ruins of Dublin's old city walls, and the oldest pub in the whole city. Despite being known as medieval Dublin, however, there are relatively few ancient houses and buildings lining the streets, a symptom of the city's feverish development over the last couple of centuries. Now home to more than half a million people, with a further one and a half million living in the Greater Dublin area, this is a huge, vibrant and modern city, which underwent a period of feverish development during the Georgian period of the 18th and early 19th centuries. At its peak, Dublin was the fifth largest city in Europe, and as such, the historic medieval streets and buildings were woefully underprepared for the influx of wealth and people during the period. While the city grew in size to encompass brand new districts, which we'll visit later on in our walk, areas like this were redeveloped, with the building of wide and convenient streets and an array of modern, capacious buildings that were light years ahead of old, wooden medieval dwellings. But it wasn't only during the Georgian period that Dublin was subject to sweeping redevelopment, as here we're looking down Cowes Lane a historic medieval alleyway that has been refurbished only recently as the home of modern apartments, shops, bars, and a popular creative designer quarter, 
making it a popular spot among Dubliners. The huge street we're walking along here, meanwhile, is Lord Edward Street, one of the city's newest and widest streets of all, laid out in the 1880s as a way of connecting traffic in the modern city centre with Christchurch Cathedral, avoiding the older, much narrower streets that skirt alongside the castle and the River Liffey. As a major city centre thoroughfare, Lord Edward Street is always busy with traffic, but it's home to plenty of interesting history in its own right, not least for its name taken from Lord Edward Fitzgerald, a prominent Irish Republican in the late 18th century and a leader of the famous anti-British rebellion of 1798. This is one of many streets surrounding Dublin Castle, the historic seat of British power, which celebrate Irish independence and rebellion. And overlooking Lord Edward Street here is one of the city's grandest Georgian era landmarks, Dublin City Hall, which was opened back in 1779. Originally built as a venue for merchants to carry out trade, the hall's grandeur clearly shows us just how prosperous business was in the city at the time, though it was later bought by the city of Dublin in the 1850s and converted into the seat of the city council, which it remains today. Home to a cafe and an exhibition on the city's history that's open to visitors, the city hall is yet another landmark worth venturing inside if you've got the time, while it too holds an association with the events of April 1916 as it was captured by the Irish citizen army and used as a garrison for soldiers to launch an assault on the castle just across the road. Beyond the city hall, this main road through the city centre changes its name to Dame Street, which was widened and redeveloped during the Georgian era, about a hundred years before Lord Edward Street was even laid out. In that period, Dame Street developed as a busy heart of business and a fashionable city centre parade home to a number of exclusive shops and one of Dublin's best-known theatres, the Olympia. With its fetching canopy entrance jutting out onto the pavement of Dame Street, the Olympia opened back in 1879, when it was known as the Star of Erin Music Hall. But although it's now home to a popular theatre and many shops, Dame Street has historically been known as the centre of Ireland's financial industry. Until very recently, almost all of the nation's biggest banks had their headquarters on Dame Street here, while a few hundred yards along from us at the end of Dame Street, you'll also find the country's central bank, the Bank of Ireland, located inside the former Irish Houses of Parliament. We'll pass by there a little later on when we make our way back onto this busy city thoroughfare. But before we turn off Dame Street, it's interesting to note that its name, as fashionable as it may sound, actually refers to a dam that once existed around here on the River Poddle, used to power local mills in the medieval city. As we mentioned earlier, the Poddle flows into the much larger River Liffey, and so let's now make our way off Dame Street and towards the Liffey, through one of the oldest parts of the modern city centre. This small street is Eustace Street, which leads straight towards the river, and despite not looking like much at first glance, it's home to its own wealth of history. Most notably, it was in the Eagle Tavern, an old bar that used to exist on this street, that the Society of United Irishmen of Dublin was founded in 1791, following the Society's original founding shortly before, up in Belfast. The formation of the Society of United Irishmen was hugely significant in the early days of modern Irish republicanism, and in 1798, feeling empowered by the American and French revolutions, they launched a huge rebellion against the British government in Ireland, seeking emancipation for suppressed Catholics and the creation of an Irish Republic. Unfortunately for the rebels, the rising was defeated by the British, and just two years later, the Kingdom of Ireland, historically a separate state, was incorporated into the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland by the Acts of Union in 1800. Of course, Ireland gained its independence just over a century later, and nowadays, this part of Dublin is an area that first comes to mind when many people think of Ireland. Here we're passing by a bar known as the Norseman, a historic pub that claims to have been established back in 1696, but which is actually thought to have began life even further back in history, in the 1500s, when it was known as the Wooden Man Tavern, as a wooden Viking figure used to stand just outside it on the street. Pubs, bars and taverns are of course one of Ireland's greatest cultural exports in the modern day, 
You'll find Irish pubs on almost every continent around the world. But perhaps the most famous Irish pub of all is the one just here, the Temple Bar Pub. One of the most popular landmarks for tourists visiting Dublin, the Temple Bar Pub has stood at the heart of one of the city's liveliest districts for nearly 200 years, officially established back in 1840. Ever since, the pub has developed as the city's quintessential watering hole, famed for its quaint and compact interior and association with traditional Irish music, performed inside throughout the day all year round. There's plenty of interesting history associated with this pub, but its name is perhaps the most intriguing. On the wall of the pub here are a number of carvings depicting some of the people historically associated with this spot in the city, all with the surname Temple. This began back in the early 17th century, when this man, Sir William Temple, a prominent teacher and philosopher, built a house on this street corner on land reclaimed from the waters of the rivers Liffey and Poddle. After his death, Temple's son, politician Sir John Temple, expanded the house and gardens that existed here, and so this area of Dublin soon came to be closely associated with this prominent family, earning it the name Temple Bar. And that's the important thing. While the pub is known as the Temple Bar, it only takes its name from the area in which it's located, and the word bar doesn't mean what you'd at first think. All of these streets are part of Temple Bar, so named for its association with the Temple family, and the fact that this was once the site of a small embankment, or sand bar, beside the River Liffey. Of course, Temple Bar today is full of bars in the sense of pubs, and it's commonly known as one of the liveliest parts of this always bustling city, filled mostly with tourists during the day and packed to the brim with both visitors and locals after the sun goes down. You'll find no shortage of places to get a drink in this part of town, the huge Keys Bar here being another of the most popular in the city centre. But even if you're not looking for somewhere to get a pint, the Temple Bar is still an area well worth exploring. We mentioned earlier that much of medieval Dublin was swept away by intense development in the Georgian era but the narrower streets of Temple Bar more closely resemble the pattern of Dublin's roads before that period, providing an old world atmosphere that's relatively hard to find elsewhere in the city. That being said, most of the buildings on the streets of Temple Bar were built in the last couple of centuries, though that doesn't make them any less interesting, as just down this alleyway, there stands a grand old guild hall built in the 19th century that's easy to miss when exploring this part of the city. Known as the Merchant's Arch for the archway that we're walking into now, this building dates from 1821, when it was opened as a guild hall, a place where an association of local merchants, or guild, would meet and collect dues. And this one was the very last guild hall built in Dublin, as just 20 years after its opening, the city's guilds were abolished for good. Walking out of the Merchant's Arch, we find ourselves on Wellington Quay the main street that follows the south bank of the River Liffey, and the historic Guildhall, which still stands overlooking the river, is now home to a pub and restaurant, the latest of a variety of different uses for the building through time, it having previously served as a school, a shirt factory and more. But let's now turn our attention to the river, which is crossed here by one of the icons of Dublin, the beautiful Haypenny Bridge. Originally built in 1816 over in England, this fetching cast iron bridge is thought to be the very first metal bridge that was constructed in Ireland. It was built on the orders of William Walsh, one of a number of men who operated small ferries crossing the River Liffey. But when his old boats began to fall apart, city authorities instructed him to either repair them or build a bridge instead. Walsh decided to build a bridge, one of the few footbridges across the Liffey, and in exchange for the cost of constructing it, he was entitled to charge people a toll to cross the river, a toll that cost one half penny, or a halfpenny. The contract was to last for 100 years, by which time the toll had increased to a penny halfpenny, that being one and a half pence, although tolls continued to be collected until 1919 after which point it's always been entirely free to cross this beautiful bridge, an extremely convenient link between the north and south banks of the Liffey. Though recently refurbished in 2001, 
Once upon a time you could see the Liffey flowing beneath you through the gaps between old wooden beams. And the river itself is well worth lending some attention to as you cross over this famous bridge. The Liffey is the 8th longest river on the island of Ireland, running for 82 miles in a big horseshoe that flows through counties Wicklow, Kildare and Dublin, before emptying out into the Irish Sea just a short distance from here. The river takes its name from the Mar Liffa, a large rolling plain in neighbouring county Wicklow through which the Liffey once flowed. Although originally this river was known by a different name, an Rurhech, which can be loosely translated from Irish as the Stampeding One, a reference to the river's fearsome flow and tendency to flood suddenly. That may have often proved a hazard to the people of early Dublin, but the river has long played an important role in the city's development through time, providing water for drinking and powering mills, acting as a navigable channel from the sea, which allowed international traders and settlers to make their way to the Black Pool, and as a natural defence for the medieval town which was once located almost entirely on this southern bank of the river. As we briefly mentioned earlier on, medieval Dublin was once surrounded by city walls, the north range of which ran parallel to the river here. Where we are now, by the Haypenny Bridge, was actually located outside the city walls, as the Temple Bar originally existed as a kind of suburb just on the edge of the city, and the riverside here was lined with a number of quays and rudimentary docks. The other bank of the river, the north side, was relatively less developed for much of the city's history. People had been living there for centuries, and the very first bridge across the Liffey was built over a thousand years ago in 1014, roughly where the modern Father Matthew Bridge stands today, a little further west from here. But as we now venture back into Temple Bar, when it came to Dublin's boom period during the Georgian era, the plentiful space on the other side of the river from the medieval town here made it ripe for development, and the very first lavish Georgian residences and townhouses were actually built on the north side of the Liffey, standing on newly built streets that were wider and straighter than anything on the south side. Nowadays, with the city home to more than half a million people, space in Dublin is at a premium and both the north and south sides of the river are highly developed, each home to a wealth of beautiful, historic landmarks and countless things to do. Though by virtue of being home to many government buildings and most of Dublin's oldest landmarks, the south side here often gets a little more attention from visitors to the city. Like many major cities around the world though, the River Divide has also created a long-standing rivalry between north and south Dublin. The North, historically stereotyped as a rougher and more underprivileged area of the city, and the South, a bit wealthier and a bit snootier. I'm of course not a Dubliner myself, so I won't pretend to know whether there's any truth in those stereotypes today. But if you are a visitor to the city, do take the time to venture over the river to the North side, as well as exploring the streets of the South side. Here in Temple Bar, we're passing by a grand building that was once the Medical School of University College Dublin until the 1930s, standing tall over Cecilia Street, which may not be the most bustling lane in this historic area of the city, but which is home to a number of offbeat independent shops and businesses, many associated with Irish music. The end of the street is marked by a striking red building daubed with what's billed as the Irish Music Wall of Fame featuring famous names including Sinead O'Connor, The Undertones, U2 and more. While inside the building, you'll find the Irish Rock and Roll Museum experience, a very popular spot in the city that tells the story of all the ups and downs of Irish rock and roll in fascinating detail. As Ireland's capital and one of the nation's main cultural centres, Dublin has produced countless famous names, not just in the world of music, but also art, literature, cinema and more with plenty of the city's most famous residents honoured with their own statues on the city streets. And later on, we'll pass by two of those statues, dedicated to Phil Lynott, the famed frontman of rock band Thin Lizzy, and Oscar Wilde, the legendary playwright. This is a city overflowing with culture wherever you look. Temple Bar alone is a real treasure trove of modern Irish culture. But it's now time for us to make our way out of this historic area of the city and return to Dame Street, still busy with traffic, making its way through the heart of Dublin. Historically, this area of Dame Street was located outside of the city walls, 
as one of the old city gates was located a short distance back down the street from where we are now. Of course, for almost the entire period when Dublin was surrounded by defensive walls, the city was under control by English and then British authorities from the 12th to the 20th centuries. Located on Ireland's east coast, directly across the sea from North Wales, Dublin here was inevitably a convenient landing place for invaders, settlers and armies coming from Great Britain. And as a result, Dublin became the heart of the strongest area of English control in the medieval period, an expanse of land that covered what were known as the Four Obedient Shires, County Dublin, County Kildare, County Meath and County Louth. This area of control was known as the Pale, and it was under the direct government of the English King from the 12th until the late 15th century. Contrary to the rest of Ireland, which was controlled in parts either by the native Irish or by English lords with greater autonomy from the King, the Pale here was effectively an integral part of England, separated from the rest of the Emerald Isle by a large ditch surrounding its territory. In the eyes of the English at the time, the lands outside the ditch were filled with barbaric, uncivilised tribes and settlements outside of the safety of English control and so it's often thought that this was the origin for the common modern phrase beyond the pale, meaning beyond the limits, though there's little real evidence to prove that this was truly the origin. While the English pale eventually faded into obscurity around the 16th and 17th centuries as British settlement and invasion began to step up across the rest of Ireland, Dublin's position at the centre of this area separate to the rest of the country is a legacy that's often referred to today. The Greater Dublin area is sometimes still even referred to as the Pale by people elsewhere in Ireland, mostly in a derogatory sense. Having spent so many years under the control and influence of authorities from across the Irish Sea, some say that you need to go beyond the Pale yourself to get the most of traditional Irish culture. But while it's certainly worth taking the time to explore the rest of Ireland after visiting Dublin, there are still plenty of examples of traditional Irish culture to be found in this beautiful city. We mentioned earlier that Dublin's name derives from the Irish Dublin, but the modern city's name is an anglicised version of that historic moniker. But in the modern Irish language, Dublin is known by an entirely different name, Balia or Hacleach, which literally translates as the town of the hurdled ford a rather majestic name that refers to the historic fording point of the River Liffey, where the very first bridge was built over the river in the 11th century, further upstream from where we are now. Having made our way off Dame Street, we now find ourselves in a network of winding, narrow streets that grew up on the outskirts of the old walled city. And it's here on St Andrew's Street that we find another of Dublin's largest churches, the historic St Andrew's Church which belonged to the Protestant Church of Ireland and was built in the 1860s. But there's much more to St Andrew's Church than that, as this is actually the fourth church to stand in this part of Dublin. The very first St Andrew's was founded in the 16th century, and it stood on Dame Street itself, but it was destroyed during Oliver Cromwell's brutal conquest of Ireland, only to be rebuilt just here in 1665, a few years after Cromwell's death. That church was then replaced by a Georgian-era church in 1793, which burned down in the 1860s, and then it was eventually rebuilt as the church that we see today. But St Andrews was eventually closed down in 2014, when it was converted into Dublin's main tourist office, outside which we find the city's beloved Molly Malone statue. The statue depicts Molly Malone, a local fishmonger wheeling her wheelbarrow through Dublin and it's based on a song that's often considered to be the unofficial anthem of the city. The song begins, In Dublin's fair city, where the girls are so pretty, I first set my eyes on sweet Molly Malone, as she wheeled her wheelbarrow through streets broad and narrow, crying cockles and mussels, alive, alive, oh. Molly Malone is a beloved figure in the city who's often thought to have wheeled her wheelbarrow during the day and worked as a prostitute by night. Though there's nothing to suggest that Molly Malone ever existed for real, but her song is sure to get plenty of Dubliners singing out loud with pride. Tourists also like to get up close and personal with Molly Malone's statue, which originally stood on nearby Grafton Street, but was moved here in 2014 when the tourist office opened. But this little corner of the city is also home to an often undersung piece of Viking heritage from over a thousand years ago, 
It was roughly where the historic O'Neill's pub stands today that the Vikings built a huge artificial hill, some 40 feet high, where the city's Scandinavian rulers would congregate and discuss the state of Dublin. This hill was known as the Thingmut, and it was a major feature on the outskirts of the old city walls, the place where Viking policies were agreed upon, criminal trials were conducted, and ceremonial executions and sacrifices to the gods were carried out. Now, the old Viking Thingmut is almost entirely invisible today, as its earth was used to raise the height of the surrounding ground during the Georgian development of this part of the city. Today, the area around College Green, Nassau Street and Trinity College is about 10 feet higher than it was over 300 years ago, a deliberate effort to reduce the impact of flooding from the nearby River Liffey. And here, we've returned to the busy main road, which is no longer named Dame Street, but College Green, just across from which we can see some grand white buildings that are now nearly 300 years old. Built in 1729, these were the Irish Houses of Parliament, the oldest bicameral parliament buildings in the world, and they were the centre of government when the Kingdom of Ireland was officially a separate state from the Kingdom of Great Britain, even though its political class was entirely dominated by English settlers. Constructed at the heart of the Irish capital during its boom period, the Houses of Parliament here were the first specifically designed to house a so-called bicameral parliament, home to two houses, the Upper House of Lords and the Lower House of Commons. But the Irish Houses of Parliament were only used as a government building for 81 years, as they became redundant with the Acts of Union in 1800 that brought Ireland under direct government from London. And so the old Parliament buildings were subsequently bought by the Bank of Ireland in 1803, remaining as the nation's central bank to this day. Here in the middle of the road, meanwhile, there stands an intriguing sculpture known as the Four Angels Fountain, a modern fountain that depicts the heralds of Ireland's four provinces, Ulster, Leinster, Munster and Connacht. In the statue, the four angels are playing their trumpets loud to awaken the people of Ireland with an iconic nationalist song, A Nation Once Again, which was written by this man, Thomas Davis. Davis, a writer and leader of the Young Ireland independence movement in the 19th century, wrote a number of Irish rebel songs during his short life, the most famous being A Nation Once Again, which became one of the most popular rallying cries for Irish nationalists as the push for independence from Britain began to gather steam through the Victorian period. As we mentioned, the 19th century began with Ireland being incorporated into the United Kingdom and Davis's song referred to Ireland as long a province that shall be a nation once again. But of course, Davis was far from the first to proclaim his desire that Ireland should be its own state, as just a few feet further along College Green, there stands a statue dedicated to one of the most prominent leaders of the Irish independence movement, Henry Grattan. From 1775 to 1800, Grattan was an MP in the House of Commons just across the road and with his famous charisma and skills for public speaking, he regularly demanded that Ireland be granted its rightful status of an independent nation. Initially, Grattan was successful in his endeavours, and in 1782 the Irish Houses of Parliament gained greater autonomy from Britain, beginning a period often known as Grattan's Parliament in his honour. Though this was unfortunately undone shortly afterwards with the Act of Union in 1800 mostly caused by British consternation with the uprising of 1798. Grattan did go on to be an MP in Westminster, albeit with a much smaller influence, but his statue here in Dublin today stands outside both the old Houses of Parliament and the place where he once studied, Trinity College Dublin. Occupying a prominent position on a busy crossroads between two of the main roads in the city centre, Trinity College is arguably the most famous institution in Dublin and one of the most prestigious universities in the world. Now Trinity College's name can be a little confusing. It's the only college that makes up the University of Dublin, slightly different from the likes of Oxford and Cambridge, which are made up of multiple different colleges. The University of Dublin is the oldest university in Ireland, and it can trace its history all the way back to 1592, when Queen Elizabeth I founded Trinity College here. This was a period when many universities were being established in cities across Europe, and having a university was commonly seen as a point of prestige. 
although the establishment of Trinity College in Dublin here was also part of the English monarchy's efforts to consolidate their power in this city, which was growing in wealth and importance as a capital of Ireland. Here, we've made our way into the spectacular grounds of Trinity College, home to beautiful open spaces and some of Dublin's grandest buildings. Now, the college grounds extend for a large area encompassing nearly 50 acres of central Dublin, but it's here you'll find many of its most famous landmarks. The square we're walking on is known as Parliament Square, laid out in the mid-18th century and a wonderful place to take in the college's beautiful surroundings. But standing on the edge of the square just in front of us is the soaring campanile of Trinity College, probably its most iconic landmark of all. Built in 1853, the campanile was meant to be the central feature flanked by two great Victorian buildings, but they were never built. What was left then was a beautiful ornamental bell tower that's popularly regarded as the centre point of the college grounds, making it a common meeting place for students. Though, according to university tradition, if the bell tolls when you're standing beneath it, then there's a good chance that you might fail your exams. To be safe, many students never walk under the campanile until they graduate. But just beyond the iconic bell tower, across the Green Library Square, is one of the most famous buildings not just in the university, but all of Ireland, the Old Library of Trinity College. Originally founded with the college back in 1592, the old library as we see it today was built in 1732, and at the time of its opening it towered over the city of Dublin as one of the city's largest buildings. Nowadays, the old library remains the largest library in all of Ireland, home to over 6 million books and other written works. But there's one work inside that everybody wants to see on a visit to the old library. Inside, you'll find the Book of Kells, an exceptional medieval manuscript dating from the 9th century that stands as a pillar of Celtic history and culture. Featuring nearly 700 pages of enigmatic writings and beautiful drawings, the book was likely written and compiled initially on the Scottish island of Iona, home to the iconic Abbey of St Columba. But after that island was attacked by Vikings, the book was likely moved to an abbey in the small Irish town of Kells in County Meath. The book became known as the Book of Kells as it remained there for around 800 years, before it was eventually moved to Dublin during Cromwell's conquest of Ireland, and ever since then it's been housed here at the city's Trinity College. A glimpse of the Book of Kells and the chance to walk among the storied bookshelves of the old library are often highlights of a visit to Dublin, but there's more to take note of when looking around the college campus here. Across Library Square, there stands one of the newest buildings in the whole college, the spectacular Graduates Memorial Building on the right of your picture, which was completed in 1902, and it plays host to the university's prestigious debating chamber and spaces belonging to some of the university's oldest student societies, including the University Philosophical Society, a debating union that was founded back in 1683 and is the oldest student society in the entire world. Through its centuries of history, the society has had plenty of famous members, ranging from Oscar Wilde to the poet Samuel Beckett and the author of Dracula, Bram Stoker. And as that list of notable alumni suggests, Trinity College here has a long tradition of producing some of the world's finest literary figures. As we take in a view of the college's Grand Chapel, built in 1798 in an almost identical shape to the examination hall across the square, Trinity College is renowned for its literature programme to this day, but the college has also produced countless notable names in a number of different spheres, significantly including four Presidents of Ireland and two Irish Taoiseachs. Now though, it's time to make our way out of the college campus, which we'll leave by walking through the front gate of the college, on top of which there stands this iconic building, Regent House which was built back in the early 18th century as Trinity College was undergoing a period of immense growth along with the rest of Dublin. When the college was first established back in 1592, it stood on the outskirts of Dublin city walls, and the reason that it was built here was that it was once the site of an old Catholic monastery. That monastery, however, was closed down on the orders of King Henry VIII during the dissolution of the monasteries in the mid-16th century, 
and its land was then converted into a university used to train new Protestant clergymen and politicians. Outside Regent House, there stands a statue of Trinity College graduate Oliver Goldsmith, a poet born in Ireland who followed the Anglican faith. Now, for much of history, Trinity College didn't allow Catholics to study degrees, as the university was part of efforts to strengthen English power over Dublin and the majority Catholic Ireland. But just here, there stands a statue of one Edmund Burke, an Anglican, Dublin-born politician who served in the British House of Commons in the 19th century, but who was a leading figure in the push for Catholic emancipation across Britain and Ireland. Since the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century, Catholics had faced heavy suppression in England, Scotland and Ireland, and this remained the case for nearly 300 years, with Catholics gradually gaining freedoms in the late 18th century, backed by Edmund Burke. While it was only in 1829, with the British government's Catholic Emancipation Act, that most restrictions were lifted on the religion. Following this, many Catholics and Protestants were studying and graduating side by side from Trinity College. But the matter wasn't fully solved, as Catholics were still prohibited from holding prestigious positions like scholar, fellow or professor until 1873. In 1871, a couple of years before that limit was lifted, the Catholic Church actually banned its members from attending Trinity College beside us. And it wasn't until extremely recently, in 1970 no less, that the ban was lifted, with people from all religious backgrounds studying at the college today. But of course to many, Trinity College was a historic symbol of the Protestant Reformation and British power in Ireland, and the student body was largely split down the middle on the issue of Irish emancipation from British rule. Many leading figures of the formerly Protestant-dominated ruling class studied at and graduated from Trinity, but the college has also produced plenty of famous Irish nationalists, including Wolf Tone, a founder of the United Society of Irishmen and often considered the father of Irish nationalism, as well as the rebel leader Robert Emmett and the very first president of an independent Ireland, Douglas Hyde. But having taken a tour of the main sites and a look at the main stories of Trinity College, we now find ourselves back out on the public streets of Dublin. And this street is usually one of the busiest in the whole city. Stretching from Trinity College up towards the beautiful St Stephen's Green, this is Grafton Street, one of Dublin's most popular shopping streets and home to some of the city's most luxurious shops and grandest buildings. In fact, in 2022, Dublin's Grafton Street was ranked as the 15th most expensive street in the world to open a shop. But this rise to retail stardom, as eye-watering as it may seem, is a perfect example of how this city has developed once neglected districts into delightfully bustling and cosmopolitan spots. Of course, this area was once quite a distance away from the centre of the medieval city at Christchurch Cathedral, and it was located just behind the old Viking Thingmut that towered over the surrounding area. For much of Dublin's history, the route which Grafton Street now follows was a simple country lane leading south from the River Liffey. But it was often flooded and as such far from the busy thoroughfare it later became. Development of the street began in the year 1708 under the supervision of the Dawson family, one of the wealthiest in Dublin. And within just 20 years, they had transformed this old country lane into one of Georgian Dublin's most fashionable streets home to a wealth of desirable residences and beautiful shops. Now unfortunately, not much of that original street remains today, as in the late 18th century, Grafton Street was largely rebuilt when it incidentally became part of one of the main routes through the now enormous Georgian city of Dublin, after the wide O'Connell Bridge was built across the Liffey in 1794. But with the north and south sides of the modern city connected like never before, even more traffic began travelling along Grafton Street here, which only continued to boom as more and more people were passing by its shop windows. However, the mid-19th century saw that feverish development come to a gradual halt across Dublin, and Grafton Street here actually fell into neglect, known in the city for a couple of decades for its broken windows and crowds of prostitutes. In fact, in the 1870s, it's thought that as many as 1,500 prostitutes were working this street. Having fallen quite far from its status as one of Dublin's most fashionable shopping parades, efforts were made to redevelop Grafton Street once again in the late Victorian era. 
when it was refashioned into the street that we see today. The only major change in recent years being the pedestrianisation of the street in 1979. A positive change that has really helped this iconic street to remain one of the most bustling places in the city, and a lovely place to take a stroll. The pedestrianised street is also now the main feature in a wider shopping area that encompasses a large part of the city centre. But just off the main parade, we find that statue we mentioned of famous Dubliner Phil Lynott, the legendary frontman of rock band Thin Lizzy. Though born over in West Bromwich in England in 1949, Lynott grew up in Dublin after he moved here at the age of just eight to live with his grandparents. And it was also in this city where he later met the fellow members of Thin Lizzy, the band behind classic hits like Whiskey in the Jar and The Boys Are Back in Town. We've already spoken about Dublin's illustrious musical heritage and the many bands that the city has produced over the years. But what you might not know is that Grafton Street and the surrounding area is where many of the city's musicians honed their skills early in their careers. Since the 1980s, Grafton Street has become known for street music and busking, adding a nice soundtrack to this already lively part of the city. And as you walk through this area, you'll hear music of all genres from buskers young and old while famous Irish singers, including the likes of Glenn Hansard of The Frames and Bono from U2, have also engaged in a bit of busking on Grafton Street in recent years. Here though, you'll notice that we've strayed off Grafton Street onto the much smaller South Anne Street, which is home to less in the way of high-end luxury shops, but arguably more characterful, independently run shops and restaurants, as well as a few more nationwide chains too. Fairly calm at the moment, this is one of many places around Grafton Street which burst into life when the sun goes down. This area of the city, therefore, being another centre of Dublin's nightlife alongside the famous pubs of Temple Bar. Now, South Anne Street takes its name from the huge building that bookends it just here, St Anne's Church. With a history dating back over 300 years to 1720, the church that we see today was quite the project built in different stages over the course of more than 140 years, its beautiful facade here being the newest feature, added in 1868. Like many Dublin churches, St Anne's has been visited by many famous locals through its history. Most notably, it was the site of Bram Stoker's wedding in 1878, as well as that of the Republican leader Wolf Tone in 1785. And it's a lovely church to pop inside and explore if you find yourself in this part of the city. Interestingly, if you venture inside St Anne's, you'll find a unique feature known as the bread shelf, quite simply a shelf on which bread is made available to anyone who chooses to receive it, a charitable tradition that began three centuries ago in 1723 to cater to the poor and hungry of the city, and which is still carried out to this day. Now St Anne's is one of a number of grand buildings that loom large over Dawson Street here which takes its name from the wealthy Dawson family who transformed Grafton Street into the height of fashion in the Georgian city. But who exactly were the Dawsons? Well, here on the street that bears their name, we're passing by the beautiful Mansion House, built in 1710 by Joshua Dawson, who was a merchant turned land developer, of course leading the development of this part of Dublin. Dawson only lived at the Mansion House for five years, as in 1715, the building was bought by the City of Dublin as a permanent residence for the Lord Mayor of Dublin, the ceremonial head of the city. Mansion House remains the Lord Mayor's residence to this day, but the building also played an important role during Ireland's revolutionary period in the early 20th century, as for three years from 1919 to 1922, it was the meeting place of the revolutionary dial, the parliament of the self-declared Irish Republic. We mentioned earlier that, in the aftermath of the Easter Rising in 1916, public opinion across Ireland turned strongly against the British authorities, and the newly established Republican Party Sinn Féin, led by Eamon de Valera, won by a landslide in the general election of December 1918. Immediately, newly elected Sinn Féin MPs refused to take their seats at the House of Commons in Westminster, and instead declared the independence of the Irish Republic on the 21st of January 1919, the day that the first session of the Revolutionary Dial was convened at the Mansion House on Dawson Street. On the same day, two Irish Republicans killed a policeman of the Royal Irish Constabulary in County Tipperary to the southwest, 
which marked the beginning of the Irish War of Independence against the British, which lasted for just over two years. Initially, the war was a quiet affair, as the British government dismissed the shooting in Tipperary, growing protests and the Declaration of Independence as matters for the police, not the army. But the following year, in 1920, the Irish Republican Army began launching violent raids on police barracks across the island, prompting the British to send paramilitary soldiers into Ireland to crush the growing rebellion. As the war drew on, the British employed more than 40,000 men to fight the much smaller Irish Republican Army, composed of just over 10,000 men. But the IRA used guerrilla tactics that cancelled out the manpower advantage of the British. And by 1921, it became apparent to London that an easy victory was nowhere near close, prompting them to agree to a ceasefire with the Irish rebels and bring the war to an end. The Irish won the war and gained independence. But things weren't quite as simple as that, and we'll talk more about the aftermath of the war in a few minutes. Here, though, we find ourselves at the very end of Grafton Street, which is marked by the spectacular Stevens Green Shopping Centre, a huge mall opened in 1988 on the site of a dilapidated area of the old Georgian city. And when it was opened, this was the largest shopping centre in all of Ireland. The shopping centre is often known to locals as the Wedding Cake for its ornate exterior. But the mall takes its official name from St Stephen's Green, the huge city park that stands just across the road from it and which we'll walk into now. Now St Stephen's Green is immense, covering more than 22 acres of the city, so we won't be able to walk around the whole park. But we'll enter from its northwest corner, through the Fusiliers Arch here, which was erected in 1907 in honour of the men of the Royal Dublin Fusiliers who lost their lives fighting in the Second Boer War. That war took place when Ireland was part of the United Kingdom, but at a time when Republican feeling was really beginning to ramp up. In fact, many at the time dubbed the Fusiliers Arch the Traitor's Arch, as it was seen as a symbol of British imperialism. Just inside the arch, we find a monument dedicated to a very different figure of Irish history. Jeremiah O'Donovan Rossa, a prominent member of the Irish Republican Brotherhood, who, in the second half of the 19th century, were the leading advocates of Irish Republicanism and were instrumental in the planning of the Easter Rising in 1916. Now, we discussed the main events of the Rising around Dublin Castle at the beginning of our walk, but the rebellion encompassed the whole city. Now, we discussed the main events of the Rising around Dublin Castle at the beginning of our walk, but the rebellion encompassed the whole city. Once upon a time, Dublin streets were filled with statues and monuments that honoured the British royal family and the British Empire, but many were destroyed during the Rising and in the years afterwards. In fact, the Fusiliers Arch that we just walked through is one of just a few British imperial landmarks that have survived in the city to this day, although it too suffered damage from crossfire during the Easter Rising. But nowadays, as we've seen, Dublin streets are populated with statues and monuments dedicated to leading figures of Irish history and of Irish republicanism. And that's also the case with St Stephen's Green here. All over the park, you'll find a wealth of captivating monuments dedicated to many prominent Irish figures, ranging from the rebel leader Robert Emmett to the poet W.B. Yeats, as well as Constance Markovich, a participant in the Easter Rising but also the first woman elected to the British House of Commons, although as a Sinn Féin MP, she didn't take her seat. In the northeastern corner of the park, we'll also encounter a spectacular monument to the 18th century revolutionary Wolf Tone. But as we make our way in that direction, let's consider the history of the park itself, a beautiful green space in this famously green nation. Once upon a time, this was a common on the edge of the city open land used for grazing. But in 1663, the local government decided to sell the land surrounding the common as space to build houses. With the city growing in size, this area was ripe for development, and rows of houses were built around this common, which became an enclosed park for the use of residents. Those original 17th century houses were later demolished and replaced by ever larger and ever more ornate Georgian and Victorian townhouses. But the park in the middle remained largely the same, albeit still only available for private use. It wasn't until 1877 that the park was opened up for all the people of Dublin, and it was redeveloped into the form that exists today, 
with a collection of snaking paths following the line of the old park walls surrounding a central open circle, and home to delightful wooded areas and a large lake here. The lake is always busy with a wide variety of ducks, geese and a collection of pesky seagulls too. And you can look out onto its tranquil waters from this fetching gazebo, built in 1898 as this park became ever more popular as a place for Dubliners to relax. While the area around Grafton Street and the city centre was admittedly one of the wealthiest districts in the city when the park was opened up, an open space like this was also a blessing to the many workers of Dublin who toiled through long shifts in squalid conditions in factories and workhouses situated in the city's poorer outer districts, especially on the north side of the river. St Stephen's Green, therefore, was meant to be a park for all Dubliners, a legacy that can also be drawn from the park's name. While this was simply open land back in the 17th century, near to that common there stood an old leper hospital on Stephen Street the street and hospital, both named after St Stephen. The park's proximity to the old hospital led it to be known as St Stephen's Green, although there was a suggestion to rename the park to Albert Green in the mid-19th century after the death of Prince Albert, Queen Victoria's husband, though those plans were fiercely shut down by the local government. As you can imagine, Queen Victoria received nowhere near the same adulation in Ireland as she did in Great Britain. She even came to be known here as the Famine Queen, as many Irish saw her as neglectful of the Emerald Isle during the devastating famine of the 1840s. While one and a half million people died in the famine, Victoria was reviled for her miserly contribution of just £2,000 of her immense imperial estate to the famine response, a sum worth around £300,000 in today's money. Despite this, celebration of Victoria continued through her reign, and a prominent statue of the Queen was even erected in 1900, a short distance away from here on Kildare Street, in front of Leinster House, which became the home of Ireland's Parliament after independence. Inevitably, Victoria's statue was neglected after independence, and it was eventually brought down in 1948, though you can still see it if you visit Queen Victoria House on the other side of the world in Sydney, Australia, where it was sent by the Irish government. But as old British royal statues were torn down across the city, new memorials were erected in their place. And here, there stands a famous memorial to the victims of the Great Famine. The memorial features the abstract figures of three people and a dog, an archetypal Irish household at the time of the famine, which was a devastating hunger infamously caused by successive failures of staple potato crops across Ireland, and which not only directly killed as many as one and a half million people, but also caused a wave of emigration as people fled Ireland to Great Britain and, most notably, the United States. Ireland's population more than halved as a result of the famine, and the country's population of around 5 million is still smaller today than it was before the Great Hunger, when this man was leading the early Republican movement. This statue depicts the famous revolutionary we've spoken so much about, Theobald Wolfe Tone, born here in Dublin in 1763 and a founding member of the Society of United Irishmen, which led the most significant rebellion against British rule for centuries in 1798. Wolf Tone travelled widely across Ireland and recruited both Protestants and Catholics for the cause of the United Irishmen, while he also struck up a strong alliance with post-revolutionary France, although his revolutionary ideals and links with Britain's longtime enemy in France eventually led to his capture in 1798. As a leading figure of a reborn revolutionary movement, Wolfe Tone was a clear threat to the British authorities, and so he was sentenced to death by hanging shortly after his capture. Although before the execution could take place, Wolfe Tone was found bleeding to death, possibly as a result of torture by British guards, or, as is most commonly believed, by his own hand. So that was just a glimpse at some of the scenery, sculptures and stories to be found inside St Stephen's Green. But having made our way out of the park now, we're walking onto Merrion Row, where you'll find a tiny but historic cemetery nestled between the buildings. Just across the road here, we can see the gate to the Huguenot Cemetery of Dublin, which was established all the way back in 1693 as the burial place for more than 600 members of Dublin's community of Huguenots. <laughs> 
French Protestants who fled here as they were falling victim to religious persecution at home. As we've mentioned, while Ireland was majority Catholic, it was in the late 17th century that the nation was coming under the tight governance of a minority Protestant ruling class, making this a safe place for Protestant Huguenots seeking refuge. And as many as 10,000 Huguenots quickly established themselves in towns and cities across the island, although half of all Huguenots in Ireland settled here in Dublin. The city's Huguenot community was a thriving one, as they brought with them new exotic skills in industries such as woodworking, weaving, watchmaking and finance that reshaped the local economy. And within a few short years, Huguenots actually came to serve a crucial role in Dublin's rapidly booming industrial sphere as leading merchants in the city. It was shortly after the influx of Huguenots into the city that Dublin's Georgian boom period began in earnest and the city's growing population contributed to a rapid growth in industrial activity, general wealth and construction work. We've already mentioned that this area of the city, behind the old Viking Thingmut, was once where the Irish capital met the countryside. But while the development of Grafton Street began at the very start of the 18th century, these streets just beyond St Stephen's Green were slightly later works of the late 18th century. From Merrion Row here, we're going to make our way towards the beautiful Merrion Square, often known as the heart of Georgian Dublin, which is surrounded by a wealth of eye-catching Georgian townhouses and the former home of one Oscar Wilde, the legendary poet and playwright born here in Dublin and whose works have gone on to be known all over the world. Just outside Merrion Square, we'll also take in a view of the National Gallery of Ireland, which will be the last landmark of our walk around the city. But before we get there, we still need to take a walk down a rather large road known as Upper Merrion Street, lined on one side by the beautiful Georgian buildings of the Five Star Merrion Hotel, one of the most prestigious in all of Ireland. But on the other side of the road, there stand the imposing Edwardian buildings of the Irish government. Situated a short distance away from the busy streets of downtown Dublin, where the old Houses of Parliament are located, the most important government buildings in the modern Republic of Ireland are mostly located here around Merrion Street. And it's just off this road that you'll find a number of key government departments, the Erechtus, Ireland's modern bicameral parliament, and the Department of the Taoiseach, the head of the Irish government. Now the grand buildings we're looking at here are simply known as the government buildings, and they were built over the course of 18 years during the last years of British rule in Ireland opened in 1922, and they were in fact the very last major public buildings built in Dublin under the British. Initially, the buildings were intended to be used by the Royal College of Science, a scientific institution that later became part of the University of Dublin. But in the 1920s, as an independent island was established, these grand edifices were chosen to host the offices and meeting chambers of the new government. Interestingly, until the late 1980s, the buildings were actually still shared between the government and the University of Dublin, an infamously cramped situation that eventually led the government to buy and refurbish the whole building for its own use, which is what remains today. So this is the heart of power and decision making in the Republic of Ireland. But who exactly works inside the government buildings? And how does the Irish government work? Well, the government is led by the Taoiseach, a title which literally means chief or leader in Irish, and which is equivalent to the position of prime minister elsewhere in the world. The government buildings are home to the department of the Taoiseach, but notably not the residence of the Taoiseach. In fact, there is no official residence for the head of the Irish government, as Taoiseach typically live in their own houses, or in one of a number of grand residences located around Dublin with the Steward's Lodge on the western edge of the city by Phoenix Park reserved for the Taoiseach's use, though the leader actually has to pay a nightly fee of around 50 euros to stay there. By convention, the Taoiseach is usually a member of the Doyle Aaron, the lower house of the Irish Parliament, and he or she needs to be able to command the support of a majority of members in the Doyle. Now the Doyle Aaron, which literally means the Assembly of Ireland, is where de facto power is vested in the Irish government, working not unlike the House of Commons in the UK. But it's only one of three parts in the Erechtus, Ireland's Parliament. The Doyle is the lower house, 
while the upper house is the Shannad Aaron, the Irish Senate, a smaller body made up of senators who aren't directly elected by the Irish people and as such have much weaker power than those in the Doyle. Officially, the Doyle and Senate are there to work together and check one another's powers and decisions, and given this role, they both meet in the same building, Leinster House, which is located just across this green behind the large obelisk. Leinster House, a Georgian-era palace built for the Duke of Leinster, has been the site of these two Houses of Parliament since 1922, but as well as the Doyle and Senate, the Erechtus has a third arm that of the President of Ireland, the nation's head of state. Since 1938, nine people have held the position of President of Ireland, a largely ceremonial office that nonetheless is directly elected by the Irish people. Officially, the President has the duty of signing bills into law, appointing the government and such, albeit only on the advice of the Doyle. One other function of the Office of President, however, is that of Commander-in-Chief of Ireland's Armed Forces, known as the Defence Forces. Now famously since independence, Ireland's Armed Forces have led peacekeeping efforts in conflict regions across the globe, and were neutral during the Second World War. But despite this long-standing policy of non-belligerence, a number of men have sadly lost their lives serving the nation. Across from the main government buildings, we're walking into Merrion Square Park, where there stands the National Memorial to the members of the Irish Defence Forces, a modern memorial unveiled in 2008 that's dedicated to all those who've lost their lives while in service, a role that includes 88 personnel since the 1960s. We'll take a closer look at the poignant interior of the National Memorial in a couple of seconds. But just beside it, there stands another poignant memorial, simply known as the Victims. Placed here in 1976, this arresting sculpture is dedicated to all victims of war, and it depicts a deceased soldier lying on a frame, surrounded by his grieving wife and mother. After all, despite its commitment to non-belligerence in recent decades, Ireland is a nation that has suffered awfully in wars throughout its history ranging from clashes between native clans and tribes more than a thousand years ago to centuries of near constant conflict with English forces, and in modern times the likes of the Crimean War and the First World War, when more than 200,000 Irish soldiers fought under the British flag. Of course the First World War was immediately followed by the Irish War of Independence, and then the Irish Civil War which was sparked by the controversial treaty that brought the guerrilla war of independence with the British to an end. That treaty was the Anglo-Irish Treaty, signed in 1921 and which created a self-governing nation known as the Irish Free State, an effectively independent nation that nonetheless was to remain a dominion of the British Empire, similar to places like Canada, Australia and New Zealand at the time. But the terms of the treaty were far from universally popular and so the Irish Free State soon descended into civil war, fought for just under a year from 1922 to 23 between pro-treaty and anti-treaty forces. The pro-treaty forces took victory, and so the Free State remained in existence, albeit still as a dominion of the British Empire, with the British King as its head of state. That, of course, is not the case today, with the Irish President the head of state, and we'll explain how that change came about in a moment. But let's take a brief look at the interior of the National War Memorial here, where there stand four statues of Irish servicemen, one from each of the Army, Navy, Air Corps and Reserve. These statues stand guard over an eternal flame, a symbol of peace for the future, and a symbol of Ireland's enduring role as a leading peacekeeping force around the world. Now, the modern Irish Defence Forces were founded back in 1924, in the immediate aftermath of the Irish Civil War where the pro-treaty forces of the Irish Free State took victory. But despite that victory, anti-treaty sentiment remained strong across the Free State, with the prominent anti-treaty politician Eamon de Valera establishing his own party, known as Fianna Foyle, and working to replace the Irish Constitution brought in by the Anglo-Irish Treaty. He managed this in 1937, when a new constitution of Ireland was created, and significantly removed many articles relating to Ireland's dominion status under the British Empire, 
and just 12 years later, in 1949, the British king was entirely removed as head of state when the country became a republic, that being the Ireland we know today. The development of the independent nation of Ireland is a fairly complex story, but it's a fascinating one that's brought the nation to where it is today, one of the most developed, wealthiest and most popular countries in Europe. As we've seen today, there's so much that Ireland has to offer, and a walk around Dublin alone has taken us through centuries of enthralling history, and introduced us to so many different parts of Ireland's world-famous culture. But here, we find what is probably the coolest statue in the whole city, dedicated to one of the most famous Dubliners of all, Oscar Wilde. Born about two streets away from here on Westland Row back in 1854, Wilde was a member of a family full of Dublin writers and he followed in their footsteps by going on to study at Trinity College, followed by a stint at the University of Oxford, and then by penning some of the most famous literary works of the 19th century, the most famous being the play The Importance of Being Earnest and the novel The Picture of Dorian Gray. Wilde's colourful statue here is perfectly emblematic of his larger-than-life persona, a character which earned him both acclaim and controversy throughout his life. Infamously, Oscar Wilde was imprisoned for two years in the 1890s at Reading Jail just outside London after being convicted of homosexuality, then regarded as the crime of gross indecency. And he died just three years after his release from jail in Paris at the age of only 46. Now Wilde is well known today for his exploits in both London and Paris, but his childhood was spent here in Dublin, specifically in this beautiful area the heart of Georgian Dublin. Merrion Square Park, in which you'll find Oscar Wilde's statue, is situated in the middle of a classic rectangle of beautiful Georgian houses, one of which was Oscar Wilde's childhood home. Just on the corner of the square here, across the road is number one Merrion Square, the building in which Wilde grew up, a rather nice house that belonged to his well-to-do family. As we mentioned, many members of the Wilde family were writers, but his father, Sir William Wilde, ran the most prestigious eye and ear medical practice out of the building, and he even served as an eye doctor to Queen Victoria during the 1860s. The old Wilde family house today is owned by the American College Dublin, but for much of the year you can visit the inside of the building and take a tour of the rooms and staircases that a young Oscar Wilde once bounded around in his lively childhood. Now there's plenty more culture to be discovered on the quintessential Georgian streets of this area of Dublin, which is today dominated by the university, with many students of Trinity College living in these beautiful, centuries-old houses, and a number of university departments also making use of many of the city's most fetching buildings. If you're in the city, it's certainly worth venturing out to this beautiful district, which is not only a little calmer than the bustling streets of Temple Bar, Grafton Street and such, but which also gives you a view of how Dublin developed during its heyday as one of Europe's largest and wealthiest cities. Simply strolling past the houses of these streets is a delight, but there's plenty to see and do around here too, with landmarks like the government buildings and Merrion Square Park, and a range of museums, including the Oscar Wilde House, a number of university museums, and the National Gallery of Ireland which is, sadly, the very last landmark on our tour. Situated just behind these railings and nestled away just beside a number of prominent government buildings, the National Gallery of Ireland is home to one of Europe's greatest art collections, drawing its origins from a great exhibition that was held just beside the modern building on the lawn of Leinster House in 1853. Just over 10 years later in 1864, the National Gallery that we see today was opened, and it's now home to a spectacularly varied collection of artworks that range from Irish paintings through the centuries to a wealth of international works by famed artists including Claude Monet, Anthony Van Dyck and Pablo Picasso. But for us, the National Gallery brings us to the end of our epic walk around Dublin for today. If you're still with us after nearly an hour and 20 minutes, then thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope you found it an interesting watch. As an immense capital city, there's so, so much more to Dublin than even what we've seen on this lengthy tour. So I hope you'll make a visit to this beautiful fair city for yourself in future, and explore everything that Dublin has to offer.